Ladies and gentlemen, Alan King. Thank you very much. Welcome to Harvard. Harvard was founded by the Puritans, the pilgrims who landed on Plymouth Rock. And it's a place filled with great humor and comedy tradition. <laughs> you know, the alumni list ranged from John Quincy Adams to Conan O'Brien, from Franklin Delano Roosevelt to Al Franken. Of course, another great wit, Vice President Al Gore <laughs> came out of Harvard. Actually, he didn't graduate. He was assembled here. Tonight, we're going to discuss comedy, how it's done, how we think about it, what inspires us. And when you talk about it academically or clinically, it can be very dull and boring. So what I've done is ask some of my very good friends to come along and help in this discussion. First, the young man who came out of the barrio literally to Broadway. He's one of the best young comedians in America today. Ladies and gentlemen, you please welcome Paul Rodriguez. Thank you. Thank you. Great to be here on The Price is Right. You're a wonderful man. <laughs> Look at all the paneling. You know, I was saying to myself back there, how many cans of pledge would it take <laughs> to get this place all shinied up? Here's a, a young lady who does stand-up. And when I say stand-up, wait till you see her. She's, a, she's terrific, plays all the clubs around the country, but she's now the head writer. She writes all the ad-libs for Rosie O'Donnell. Will you <laughs> say hello to Judy Gold? You get out of here, get you! Out. Wait a minute. Do we look like a sitcom or what? <laughs> On the WB network. <laughs> just a thought. Judy, we're very pleased to have you with us. Thank and you. I must say, you're just the right height. Thank you. Maybe you'll get a ladder for later. <laughs> okay. Judy Gold. <laughs> the next two gentlemen are legends of comedy. And that means their career is over. <laughs> when we talk about funny, this is what funny is. Tim Conway. Good to see me. So nice to see me. Thank you very much. How are you? <laughs> Wonderful thing. Let oh, us I pray. <laughs> There's a guy I've known all of my adult life. Ladies and gentlemen, Buddy Hackett. I'm, I'm very glad to be here at Harvard. I was invited to go to Oxford, but I couldn't go account of the language barrier. <laughs> Sit down. <laughs> All right, this is, we're at Harvard, and uh, we're here to discuss the art and science or whatever of comedy. Let me ask you, Paul, was the first person to make you laugh? Absolutely, my father. My father was very, very, very funny. He, he, I just lost him. Uh, he, he died about three months ago. My father raised 12 of us as migrant farm workers. 
My father was so funny, he'd make us forget we were hungry, <laughs> broke, poor. He just had a great sense of humor. That's good. Dad. Judy? I'm supposed to follow that? <laughs> But that wasn't that funny. But I, I wasn't trying well, to be funny. Well, the migrants. Oh. Who, who my, my, actually, I was going to say my father too, because he used to like curse he at everyone in the car. Yeah, like... but we actually had a car, and I feel bad that you. <laughs> and I feel bad. <laughs> but no, I mean my family was very funny. But if I think people like Lucy and Carol Burnett, and they really inspired me and, and cracked me up a lot when I was growing up. Oh wait a minute, that's professionally, professionally. Speaking. Well, let's go oh, back to the all. beginning. Who's the first professional besides Zapata that made you laugh? <laughs> Zapata. <laughs> We're gonna get ethnic here. Oh, all night. Oh, fine. Oy vey, fine. <laughs> Without a doubt, without a doubt, hands down, Richard Pryor. Good. I think you'll get a big vote. Not in this uh, oh, crowd here, in this but, crowd, uh, I but, uh, but the three people watching us on public television, yeah. they, uh, they'll get a big kick out of that. Tim? Uh, the first person to make me laugh was uh, Paul's father. Um, <laughs> he, um, <laughs> The funny thing was that he was a professional, and he said, I try out the material on the kids. I tell them, you know, that we're poor and we don't have any food, and I make them feel better. And then he'd go over to Judy's house, and, um, and I loved him. He'd stop in the neighborhood and uh, tell us these uh, ethnic jokes. You know, it was great. It really was. I, I, I was. He was a hysterical guy. Uh, I got a lot of humor from uh, my family, seriously. My, my parents were extremely humorous, never knew it, but they, uh, you know... This is a true story. My dad uh, was Irish. You could not tell him anything. Whatever he did was right. Uh, he put in a doorbell in our house one time that he put in backwards so that it rang all the time except when you pressed the doorbell. I swear to God. I swear. And I said to him, you know, Dad, that you've got the wires crossed. That's, you know, that's in wrong. He said, no, it's not. Leave it alone. So we would sit at night and listen to this <laughs> and when it would stop, my dad would say, I'll get it. <laughs> All right, let's discuss what's funny. The first thing, we got to get it out of the way. Nice is not fun. No, it, there's no way. Caring, generosity, beauty. It's not funny. Excuse me. Now, nasty is funny. No. No? No. First of all, what funny is, is relief from pain. Someone has a physical pain or a psychological pain. That's gas. <laughs> <laughs> That's not humor. That's gas. <laughs> What are, what are you talking about? Release of pain? <laughs> not re, not no. release. Press, not release. All right, now relief. Let <laughs> them fight it out now. <clears throat> why why is deprivation funny? Why are we always doing things like? Uh, uh, I, I think that all comedy is is very cruel. Yeah, it's targeted at certain things. You're so fat that you're so thin that uh, uh, I knew a lady who was so fat uh, that uh, uh, she went to a masquerade party. She wore green pajamas and went as two acres of crabgrass. Now you see, basically. <laughs> Uh, what you're doing is making fun of uh, overweight people. I think, yeah, you have to have a target. I don't know of any uh, kind uh, humor uh, that uh, actually comes up funny, but... Uh, I don't think you have to have a target. No, I don't you? think you have to I have a target you either. I don't. I definitely don't. <laughs> no, I don't. Uh, Judy, I was just waiting to see yeah. if anybody picked Judy, up on I, that. I, yeah. Yes. <laughs> Beauty is not funny. I, just a minute. I, what do we no, think? Is it funny or not? Huh? It's not funny. It's not funny. <laughs> Beauty is not funny until, well, let's say the, the one the young woman who brought a great deal of beauty and humor, first really attractive comedian, was Lucy. Right. right. Now, you're a beautiful young lady. Thank you, Alan. And how do you play against your attractiveness? Well, you? I think my height is the thing that... What? Well, is that a short joke? Oh, yes, I'm sorry. it is, Tim. <laughs> no, I think people say, I mean, I think I'm tall, and that makes me vulnerable because I had a hard childhood being this tall at such a young age, and I think I got a sense of humor from being called Bigfoot every day of my life. And now, 
No, but do you in your stand-up? No. Do you do you use that? Do you well, talk? I do because I, I'm abrasive in a certain way sometimes on stage, and I say what I think, and I think I get to back it up with being this tall. <laughs> Why is sex? Excuse me. Yeah. I was up to relief from pain. <laughs> All right, now wait a minute, now wait a minute. All right, no, seriously, buddy, go ahead, tell I'm me about it. I'm very serious. I know you are. Because if you could make somebody, I've had letters as you've had saying, I lost my husband, I loved one, I had cancer, something like that. I thought I'd never laugh again, and I came and saw you, and I laughed, and my life started over. Relief from pain is humor. When someone slips on a banana peel and the whole crowd laughs, they're laughing because it wasn't them that slipped on the banana peel. So that's what I mean by relief of pain. Really? And everybody thinks they have a sense of humor. It, it's no, no, I think, I think you're, you're hitting it right on the head. The thing about our profession here, unlike any other of forms of, of art forms, when you go see a, a great pianist, you wouldn't have the courage to walk up to them and go, you know, you missed a note here and there. You, <laughs> you, you hear, you know, you, you hear Horowitz, you wouldn't have the chutzpah, and there's a Mexican word I just used. <laughs> you wouldn't have the chutzpah, the cojones, if you will, to walk up to Hor Horowitz and go, listen, I thought your note was a little flat, I thought you could have done this. I went to get my, uh, my car, my muffler uh, changed, and I just done a show on HBO, and uh, <clears throat> the guy comes from under fixing my muffler and go, you know, <clears throat> That uh, joke that you did, you should have turned it around and uh, you could have got a bigger laugh. And I'm saying to myself, schmuck, get under my car and fix my muffler. Well, everybody seems to feel... Because that they're, they're funny. That they're funny. And the other thing is they think to see, they feel that it's easy. Yes. Mm -hmm. Now, you're not in a, per se, a, a talking or, you know, or a stand-up or a jokester. You're, you, you know... I must have been... <laughs> I, <laughs> I, I have a nightclub act. I know you do. People but, will all right, now wait a minute. Okay, it, all right. I clear a room. <laughs> all right, but let's say, when I introduced you, you did what we would call a physical a stick. Physical stick, yes. Physical. Yeah. And, and you do all these characters. Right. Now, are they based on affirmities and pain? And, and, and illnesses, and the, you know, and the, I've seen you. Well, yes, they are. Um, <laughs> I pick out crippled people and I make fun of them. That's why they don't laugh at me with my stand up routine. <laughs> Yeah, I just ruin people's lives. That's what that. <laughs> um, no, I, I I observe people, I guess, and um, uh, and try to recreate that person or try to recreate something that's familiar with the audience. And also, I try not to be too cruel. L let me give you an example. Here's a, a a true story of of my wife and I, and this is just. A story it has nothing to do with sex. It has nothing to do with language. It has nothing to do with... We're uh, in uh, Greenwich Village, and uh, I was doing a play up there, or down there, and um, we're in a, a, a hotel, a Hyatt hotel. At the head of the bed, uh, here at the headboard, there's a little light that turns on and off the hall light. Now, I noticed this about the first day I go in there, and I go, gee, that, well, that turns on the light out there. I guess in case you want to get up in the middle of the night, and you have to go, you just put this light on right. So one night, I take the pillow and I put it over the switch like this and I put my hand on the switch like this so my wife cannot see that I have my hand on the switch. <laughs> she comes in bed, she gets in bed, and sure, she's sitting there, to, and she goes, <coughs> and I turn the light on. <laughs> she goes, uh, what was that? I said, what? She said, uh, the hall light went on. <laughs> so, Gee, I don't know, why? What? Well, why would that go on? I said, oh, no, no idea, really. <laughs> oh, I said, you know what? I, I bet you it's, it's one of those clapper lights. <laughs> that when you clap, it goes off. She goes, what are you talking about? I said, well, you know, they put them in hotels now. And for, you know, handicapped people and things like that, it, you know, boom. Get out of here, she said. I said, no, go ahead, try it. She goes, and I go. <laughs> she goes, I'll be darned. Turn it back on. So, so, you know, so there, so that, just don't worry about it, right? 
Now she puts a cough drop in her mouth and she sucks it on all. She goes, crack with a thing and I go, <laughs> She goes, I said, uh, you know, it's probably pretty sensitive, so just try not to do that again. <laughs> So she snaps, it goes off, right? <laughs> so we're sitting there a while, and she goes, you know, I don't think, and I turn it on. <laughs> oh, that's just good. So she goes back on, and I just, you can't talk that loud, you know, because it's sensitive like this. <laughs> she goes, I've had enough of this crap, right? She's gonna call now the manager to come up, right? <laughs> Here she is with the manager. I'm telling you. <laughs> and he's going, <clears throat> it goes uh, on and off, and you do that? <laughs> and I'm going. That could be a sketch on Carabinet. Right, it will you be as soon as she gets back on the air. <laughs> <laughs> the best place, see, but... <clears throat> Now, Judy, you're writing for, you're writing for Rosie O'Donnell. Right. Uh, you have to all of a sudden forget about the fact of what you think is funny or what you use on a stage. Right. Now you have to write for someone else. Someone now, else's voice. So right. what do you do? You, how, do you put yourself literally inside her mind? Or what do you do? Yeah, you actually think, what does she think is funny? You have to watch that show and watch everything she does. If she looks around, like I'm in charge, I don't know if you know, she has a, it's called a digicard. It's like desk buttons with, she presses them. There's little songs, bits of songs. And I have to think, what would, what, would, what would prompt her to press a desk button and, and, and want to play a song or, or put on a theme of a TV show that she hears? Like, if she, she talks about something, I go and find that theme of that TV show. So you're kind of thinking in someone else's brain, and it is very hard. And I, I have to say, I did a show with Alan. I, I had just, I'd been working there for a few months, and I did stand up uh, with Alan, and I hadn't done it for a while. And he says to me, you know, I know you're writing for Rosie, and it's very nice, but you can't give this up. And from that day on, I started doing stand-up at least once or twice a week so that I could actually it's, keep my voice. That's right. Keep your own voice, your own thought. Mm -hmm. Paul, you, you came out of the barrio, okay? I mean, you, you, in a sense, you, you're, you're Mexican-American with the jokes that you do. Now, you crossed over. You, you're accepted by all audiences. Now, what do you do? Is, your, is, the, theme, is the theme still... Humor through the eyes and ears of a, of a, of a Mexican? Uh, well, yeah, you know, I mean, uh, you can't change what got you there. I mean, at first, I, I, I used to receive a lot of uh, uh, bad mail and uh, my own father, as a matter of fact. The first time I did The Tonight Show, uh, he, he, I said, Dad, you know, I'm going to be on The Tonight Show back when Johnny Carson was like the Pope, you know, when he mentioned your name, you were a comic overnight. And uh, a lot of, you know, a lot of auditions and stuff. And uh, I told my father I was going to be on The Tonight Show. And he says, what time is that on? And I said, it's at 11.30. And he goes, who's going to be up at that hour? <laughs> Who watches it? You know, get, your sh get yourself a show around noon. You know, <laughs> when, 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 during lunch, people will see you. Who the hell's up at 11.30? When the... you said like this, that yes. you got bad mail, does that mean it came postage due? <laughs> Or, <laughs> what is bad mail? You can't get mad at this man. No, no. You can't. Oh, you ask can't. me. It's easy. Now. No. <laughs> but, pa, you do what you do. No, no, but you... You, I, look, like a, you look like a professor here at Howard. Excuse me. All of, the, all of a sudden, you're not Alan King. You're, you're, you're William Buckley. Look. Don't, well, you know, my father had this alarm, this doorbell. <laughs> <laughs> and it, and he, he, he used to make the sound of the cucaracha, you know. Da -da 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 -da. And, uh... Uh, what, I, what I want to ask is the jokes that you do, and I've seen you stand up right, right. many, many times. When you hear a Caucasian do jokes about Hispanics, about Chicanos, are you offended? If it's funny, no. No, and I think, I think you got to take as good as you give. I believe that, that the only offensive joke is a joke that is not funny. Really? If it's not funny, it's offensive in itself. For example, some of the best stand-up comics are Jews. And I, I, I don't think that, I think that to a certain extent, they have been outcast and aliens in every corner. I mean, they invented suffering. You've told me that. I you remember know? I used to be a Jew. So consequently... <laughs> 
But then I had an extension put on. <laughs> Good God. I, I, God I, I remember. You know, this, this, no, but this John Wayne Bobbitt thing's got to stop with you, seriously. <laughs> Oh, that's a good story. The guy, uh, <laughs> the guy tripped in the desert and he hit an old lamp and the genie said, you get one wish. He said, I want to be in bed with three of the world's wildest women. Boom, he's with Lorena Bobbitt, he's with Tanya Harding, he's with Hillary Clinton. Next morning, he wakes up, bloody knees, a cut off dick, and he can't get any medical. <laughs> follow that. You, you don't. reminded me. You reminded me. You, you don't. Me. You don't. You know, we should all go down to the editing room and just <laughs> see how busy they are down there. Oh, God. <laughs> the director, <laughs> clip, clip, clip. You know, why are bodily functions so funny? Do you, do you ever think about it? Half the jokes, or more than half the jokes, are about something about the body. I mean, uh, funny. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Comedy originally springs from ritual phallic songs, so said Aristotle. The penis has always been funny since the Greeks. Why? Well, if you had... As <laughs> <laughs> a leading penis. question, Judy. Know, My but... penis is not that funny, by the way. <laughs> Because it's, it's such a taboo, anything that's taboo, that, that people, if you say what people are thinking but are too f afraid to, to say, it's funny. It's the truth. The truth is funny. It's also rhythm and uh, uh, how you arrange the words. Uh, if you're talking about a bodily function, um, uh, you know, nowadays you have to eat a lot of roughage. My wife makes me eat, uh, you know, this lettuce and uh, uh, shredded wheat and bran and straw and everything. Um, <laughs> I've eaten uh, so much roughage that I'm starting to pass wicker furniture. No. <laughs> all right. Without that, okay. All right. See, now, that's what's your answer? Uh, that's that right. your answer. Hey, you I, now, what is that? Did you picture that, or did you? Is that, that rhythm, that's, yes. or was that <laughs> well, what, uh, just what was that? Do you suppose? Because no I have no idea. A furniture store coming out of your butt. <laughs> <laughs> it was hilarious. That's how I saw there it. No, go. I. No, I, I saw any furniture. No, 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 no. No, how I. About if, how about if we all ethnically, you know, evacuated ourselves? I, I could build an adobe building, I guess. You know. No, I don't. I, I don't think it's the wick of furniture coming out. I think it's com the pot that it's coming out of. The fact that it's anal. Or is it just rhythm and words? Is wick well, of furniture a funny word? It's a surprise word? too. No, no, no. Yeah. I, I don't disagree, but I think there's more to it. The whoopee cushion. Ah. Was the one of the. All right. Now, really? Well, you I mean, know. amateurs, guys, kids at school. Right. Guys sit down, and everybody falls down laughing. That's a bodily function. Why is everybody laughing? I'm going to tell you, I know. Especially when you don't Wait use a, a whoopee cushion. No, no, let him go. <laughs> when there's no whoopee cushion there, that's when it's really funny. <laughs> you see, I, I was, you always hear about golf jokes, you know, but as soon as you put something in it, from bodily function. Like the guy went to the doctor and said, every time I hit a five iron, I fart. People start to laugh right away. Of course. So the doctor says, I'm a golfer, so that's why I came to see you. He said, I got a set of clubs in the closet. Swing that five iron. The guy went, <laughs> the doctor said, hold it, hit the six. Try a wood, take a couple putts, hit the five again. <laughs> the doctor said, just wait one moment, just wait a moment. And he went out, he come back with a long pole. The guy said, what are you going to do with that? He said, I'm going to open a couple of windows in here. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> all right, it's, funny joke. Right. Funny joke. Right. Why? <laughs> well, because, first of all, it's got a no Henry finish. Yes, we don't know good. what's coming. All right, good, That's good. one. Another thing is, a guy goes to the doctor and tells him that what happens with a five iron, it's ridiculous. And the doctor just happens to have a set of golf clubs in his office. <laughs> the whole thing is ridiculous. Someone asked Chaplin, uh, he was uh, uh, conducting or a seminar directors, and someone said, Mr. Chaplin, here's the, the basic comedy situation. A banana peel, a fat woman. Mm -hmm. You shoot the banana peel first, 
You shoot the woman first. What do you do? How do you set the scene up? And Chapman said, it doesn't matter whether you shoot the banana peel first or the fat woman first. He says, but what you do is when she comes up to the banana peel, she steps over the banana peel and falls into an open manhole. <laughs> you see, wow. that's the surprise. Yeah. The best example of comedy and tragedy that I've ever had had something to do with the proverbial banana peel. Uh, comedy is when you see a... Uh, an old woman slip and fall on a banana peel, that's comedy. Tragedy is if that old woman's your mother. What has happened in my lifetime as a comedian is I have seen us all of a sudden freed with language. When I was a kid working in theaters, oh. you couldn't say hell. You couldn't you say could, damn. You couldn't say damn. Well, actually, you could, but there were repercussions. No, 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 no you no, couldn't. No. You were told you before were, you went it on. It was in your contract. That's right, in your contract. And backstage was a big sign Absolutely. of what words you couldn't say. Exactly right. They were written down there? Uh, yes. There. All right, but now... You couldn't have taken that sign and go, look, these are the things that I would have said. <laughs> <laughs> if you never wanted to work again, you could have done But you it. didn't say them. The people were reading them. Oh, yeah, sure. There was a lot of, <laughs> there was a lot of work for mimes back then. <laughs> You said, now we have, I don't know, six, seven hundred people here. Wow. Uh, <laughs> I, can't, I got 33 up here, maybe. <laughs> I never measured in mathematics. Right. Okay, now. Okay. We got a hundred people here, tops. Here's <laughs> All our comedy lives, we made fun of people that had, you know, infirmity. They stuttered, that was always funny, stutterers. Yes. Yeah. People that walked funny. And now all of a sudden, you know, uh, if you do a joke about the loss of memory, joke, uh, Alzheimer's. You know, I, I actually cool. perform, no joke, I actually perform in front of the National Alzheimer's Association. You Who's, weren't there? No, seriously. No, story? really? I did. Yes, I remember it. But, you know, it's two old men sitting at a table. One guy says, I can't remember my name. I can't remember my grandchildren's names. And the other guy says, me, I have no trouble remember anything. He said, come in. <laughs> All right. That's a funny joke. You're going to get letters. All of a sudden, you get letters. You know? Well, the one is the guy standing on a, on a street corner crying. Yes. And a man come over to him and said, what's the matter? He said, well, my wife died. He said, I'm so sorry. No, no, he said, that was nine years ago. Since then, I met another woman. I'm 83 years old, she's 46, she loves me, takes care. I never had sex like this in my whole life. Washes my clothes, feeds me, takes care of me, <laughs> looks after me. He says, why are you crying? He says, I forgot where I live. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right, you know, you can't do jokes about drunks anymore. Because you immediately get... I don't know why we're so tight. That's what I'm I getting... don't know what, what... What is the problem with... With every group has an axe to grind. Why are we so sensitive? Why are we so tight? That's what why? I'm asking. That's why That's we're what I'm trying under. to answer. Oh. <laughs> You're asking it with a question mark. Yes, I am. Okay. <laughs> am I? Sit up straight. Yes, I am. No, I, th I think really it's about... It's about time that all of us realize the old proverbial, if you can't take a joke, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. Blah blah, wow. blah, blah, blah. Yeah, blah, 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 but there's a lot of... About 60 years ago, one of the most brilliant, legendary film comedians, W.C. Fields, mm. who at a time when everybody thought we were quite puritanical, and, you know, that was the period where, you know, you had a married couple had to sleep in single beds, you know, separate beds. W.C. Fields was the cruelest, yeah. meanest man. Fields did terrible <laughs> jokes about children. He w and he was a drunk, you know, and he did, you say, blind is not funny? W. C. Fields in a famous scene, a blind man at a free lunch, you know, touching everything, and Fields slaps him on the head. 
What about the blind man with the dog walking across the street and he gets the other side and a guy says to him, is, is that your dog nearly got you killed? He says, he did. He says, yeah, you are lucky to have gotten across the street. So he reached in his pocket, he took out a dog biscuit. He said, he nearly got you killed, you're going to feed him? He said, I, I want to find out where his head is so I can <laughs> kick him in his ass. <laughs> All right, Judy. You, that takes care of blind dogs <laughs> and traffic. <laughs> Judy, what restrictions, I mean, how do you go about talking, doing the jokes where you can say the things you want and yet there are certain subject matters you, you're not allowed to say? Writing for Rosie, first of all. We yeah, let's talk about Rosie and then talk all right, about what you Rosie, do. Rosie, for her, she, you cannot be mean at all. She doesn't want to offend anyone. Me, I want to offend everyone. I want to just push everyone's buttons and, like, all right, it's like you can't say anything anymore. I was at a bar in LA a few weeks ago. I'm having a beer. This woman comes over to the bartender. She didn't want to offend him. She orders an African American Russian. I mean, I'm sick of this. <laughs> you know, I'm sick of these people. You can't say anything anymore. Black Russian. That's a Kahlua milk. Little. All right, maybe. You got to say what you want to say. I don't know. I, I, I take a lot of risks. Well, I, I still take a lot of risks. Now, on the other hand, I remember when... Uh, you have to whisper while I'm talking? What are you talking I, about? Do you see them whispering? It's offensive, you, isn't it? Well, buddy... And, 38C. Okay? <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> when we played nightclubs before there were comedy clubs, our presentation was different. I had the I was the only comic on a bill. And now all of a sudden, I do the Toyota Comedy Festival every year and I use about 80 comedians. And I go around to the clubs to see the new young comedians. What? It's impossible. There's seven comedians in a row. The first guy talks about his girlfriend and the thing, that's funny. The next, all of a sudden you get to the sixth comedian, there's nothing to talk about anymore. It's repetitious. And then language. And now, because there are so many, they got to beat you up. Even if if you one guy says eight dirty words, the next guy's got to say 40 dirty words. Even it's got to top them. Even when we did benefits and you had five, six comedians, they broke it up with uh, music acts and right. side acts and all. And, and you know yeah. what happens? Everybody is trying to outdo everybody else. And language. Now, obviously, I, I wasn't allowed to use it, as we said. But I, when I watch... Say a couple of shits and and get the bitterness right all out. All right. <laughs> you have a marvelous attitude about <laughs> life. <laughs> When, you know, the, the English language is, is quite limited. And anything that exposes it, expands it, if it's profanity, that's great. The, the shock of the out, language will get an audience rolling. I'm, I'm not targeting the guys who use it because some guys use it correctly. Right. Other guys, as you say, come out and just <laughs> throw it out. Uh, here's an example. What I'm going to do is tell you a story about sex without using the language, and then Buddy will, or you guys, yeah. tell us a joke what, I'm about not an, sex. I'm just, oh, okay, oh, yeah, oh. you don't have an iCloud. No. no, 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 no. <laughs> I'm going to show you. We're the Phil. We're uh, Phil. That's Phil. right. They, I'm going to show you that. And I've never had sex. That's so. right. <laughs> that it can be well, equally as can funny <laughs> with the language. And not, even though. Okay. Okay, all right. All right. Here Here's, this is how my father explains sex to me. Um, when he explained sex to me, he talked about the birds and the bees, which was confusing to me because it was all about animals. So my first date was with a hornet, which was painful. Okay, but anyway. We're, going, we're driving out in the country one day, and I look out in this field, and there's a bull and a cow out in the field. And this <clears throat> bull, uh, evidently it had been a strong wind, had been blown up onto the back of this cow. <laughs> And I think the cow saw the humor in that because she had kind of a smile on her face. So, I said to my dad, what are they doing? And he said, not to get involved, they're making cookies. 
Now, I'll show you how this later confused me when I got older. I started dating a girl when I was about 14, and she called up one day and she said, would you like to come over and make some brownies? I said, geez, I'd love to, but I don't think it's windy enough. So. Now, I, I don't know if Buddy has a joke that might... Of course. Oh, okay. <laughs> hey, we're talking to professionals here. Of course. Here. Go okay. ahead, let him have now. it. All right. Uh, there was a brown cow and a white cow and a bull down in the field. And the mother was in the, talking to some of her friends with tea. And the little boy come running in and said, Mama, Mama, the bull is f***ing the brown cow. And mother said, don't say that. That's not right. Don't say that. Say the bull surprised the brown cow. <laughs> Little while later, the kid come running and said, Mama, Mama, she said, I know what you're going to say. The bull surprised the white cow. And the kid said, he certainly did. He's the brown one again. <laughs> <laughs> I ask you. Well, now you put that on the applause meter at equal. No, no, no. I, impartial as I am, his True. joke was easier because the minute he used that kind of language, everybody, you know, it's such. Your joke took telling, took explaining, portrayed. a drama, portrayed. you know? Right. right. You portrayed. <clears throat> and the setup, such right. a perfect setup. That set comes by the fact they don't have an act. <laughs> No, that's what I'm saying. That, that you know, I can't do it because I and I do it in my personal life. I, you know, I swear God only knows, but I can't do it in front of an audience because I think they expect a certain thing and when I they see me. Do it in front and of that's an right. Audience. But that's right. I've never, I never, I never use language except on stage. If you can't get paid, why say it? <laughs> for example, for example, that that Tim, mm. he, the way the way he told his joke, it was crafty. It, you know, it was something my mother would enjoy. I enjoy it. It's wonderful, but it does not detract from from this filth. No, bag. absolutely. No. <laughs> I knew all these stories all of my life. We all knew them. We heard them in locker rooms. We heard them. Right. When guys got together and told it. You never told it to women. You never told it in mixed company. I in 1961, I said ass on stage for the very first time. Never said it before. In 61, I told a story to the boss of a club, Buzzy Rifkin, in, the, in Chicago. And uh, he says, why don't you tell that on the stage? I said, may I? He said, sure. So the story was, I'm in the Army, and we had a colonel that we called Fat Ass Johnson. And, uh, but we never said it to his face. But I'm working in a motor pool, and the phone rang. And I pick it up, I said, hello. And the boy said, soldier, what vehicles have you got available? I said, six Jeeps, seven trucks, an M8 armored car, and a half track and Fat Ass Johnson's command car. Soldier, have you any idea who you're talking to? No, sir. This is Colonel Johnson. Colonel, <laughs> have you any idea who you're talking to? No. Bye-bye, Fat Ass. <laughs> <laughs> the next day, the next day, the newspapers ripped me. How dare he use the three-letter word? They went, so I got pissed off. Now I come out the next night, I say, you think ass is a bad word? Hand is a bad word. A hand could grab you by the throat. A hand got a pistol in it pointing at your face. You're frightened. Same guy got the, the pistol stuck in his ass. Who cares? <laughs> I don't walk in 2 o'clock in the morning and say, this is a stick-up. <laughs> oh, so I noticed. <laughs> I, I want to give you an example of taking a word out of a joke and see if it makes any difference. Oh, well, let's do that. Let's, all right. Okay. Let's, all right, uh, a, a, a guy goes up to a farmhouse, knocks on the door, right? A little kid comes to the door, he's about 10 years old, and the guy says, excuse me, son, but your father is out there in the field having an affair with a donkey. And the kid says, ah, he always does that. Now. <laughs> <laughs> but if you put the word in, obviously. No, do you spoil the joke if you put the word you in? You think so? Oh, yeah. affair with a donkey is right. much funnier. Right. Well, let's talk about how we, all right, we talk about structuring a joke. Yeah. Right. How, uh, a joke should be, in a sense, a story. 
it should have a beginning, a middle, and an end. And if it takes a second or it takes a minute, that's what it should have. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It should have, and it should also capture your attention so that when the punchline comes, you're, you're taken either by surprise or the other way where you, you know what the ending is and you go along with it. That's two ways to tell a joke or tell a story. You, buddy, are, you, you told us a dozen stories. Where does that story originate? I, no, I first of all, it. I hear a punchline. I hear something funny. And then I build something on the front of it. I build a story on the front of it. Today. Well, how about Tim? Yes. Now, here's a joke. Now, here's a construction of a joke that might lead you to uh, surprises because you might think you know what it is, and yet, do you? You know. I'm sitting in the doctor's office, and a call comes in from a lady, and she's uh, talking to the uh, receptionist. And she says, uh, uh, I want to talk to the doctor. And the receptionist says, you can't. Uh, he, he doesn't talk to anybody. Uh, could you tell me what's wrong? And she said, OK. Uh, now, you hear all this. And she said, uh, I have an emergency. And she said, what is it? She said, my husband has mixed up the Bengay and the Preparation H. <laughs> and the receptionist says, well, how do you know? And the lady said, well, I noticed that his shoulders started to shrink. <laughs> and when he came out of the toilet, he ran to Detroit. So, <laughs> now, those are... Those are all word, picture, construction type thing. You write Rhythm a type. Right. Me, you write a joke, Judy. Wait, one moment, please. Huh? You write a joke, Judy. Mm -hmm. You sit down. Do you write stories or jokes, or do you really uh, go, I, you, I, one liners and kind of thing? I, I feel like I take experiences I have and personalize. So there's them. no beginning, a middle, and end. You just can, there's a continuity to your life, mm -hmm. you know, experiences. Right. right. Well, I, I have a joke about how. Um, I was in Amsterdam and I went to the Anne Frank house and I was very moved and I thought this place is unbelievable. I mean these people lived in the smallest space for two and a half years. They couldn't make any noise all day for fear of being caught by the Nazis, which would have been the demise of my entire family because there's no way my mother would have kept her mouth shut for the entire <laughs> afternoon. <laughs> she would have thought, yes, you'd have washed that dish ten minutes ago. <laughs> shut up. We're gonna <laughs> That's right, we're going to get caught and we're all going to die because you couldn't wash a <laughs> damn dish. <laughs> but like the picture. Right, right, but I, and, and I was in there and I thought, oh my, you know, because you go, what if my family, and, and it's so painful that you want to... Every comedian has I a moment. I one pertinent thing to say about what Tim told about the story about the guy with the Bengay and oh, that oh, one. And this is very important because this is how delicate I work on stuff. When you said he ran to Detroit. Mm -hmm. But if you use the word jogged, it's funnier than ran. I'm going to, if I ever get an act Next together, day, he jogs to Detroit. <laughs> All right, wait, 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 wait let's go back to Jog is funnier than ran? Jogged to Detroit. No, it stands out clearer. It's a clearer word jogged because it has a glottal shock. The guy went to the doctor, he says, doctor, he says, I'm having a great problem with my sex. The doctor said, you, you don't exercise enough. You should jog. <laughs> you should jog 10 miles every day. He says, it'll improve your sex life. And he says, and call me in 10 days. And 10 days later, he called the doctor. The doctor, he says, you've been running 10 miles every day? He said, yes. He says, and how's your sex life? He says, I don't know, I'm in Cleveland. <laughs> now. I only but no, but what I'm in that joke. <laughs> The word jog. Jog works better. Jog though. works. Not jog. my joke. Now, the Anne Frank thing, right? Yes. There was an actress. She was so bad, and she was playing Anne Frank. Do you know that story? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> good, well. Uh. Tell them. Yes. You know what? Oh, there, she was so bad, this actress, that when the Nazis came into the house, <laughs> and they're looking around, the audience yelled, she's in the attic. <laughs> <laughs> There's also a, a thing called the Holy Trinity. You know, when you're telling a joke... Three steps. And threes. Right. It never works in twos, and four is too much. But three right. is perfect. And you know, you know something? Especially if you're doing racial jokes. You know, a black guy, an Irishman, and a, and a white guy. It's always three guys. It's right. always three. There's something mystical about that. It's, it's, it's the... You know, and if you try it with two, it doesn't work. And if you try it with four, it's too much. And, and I you know, if you go to seven, to it works again. Does it go with seven? <laughs> Swear to God. It you starts know, to I'm here to learn. This is Harvard. No, that's yeah. true. 
I want to talk about political humor and politics. Paul, you're going to do a political joke. You said something to me this afternoon, I fell down. We walk It's out. true, it's not a joke, it's a fact. Uh, the last four presidents that Mexico has had uh, went to Harvard. This is where they learned how to steal. <laughs> Okay. Good, see? All right. Not only that, but I would venture to say that a lot of dictators have gotten their degrees here. There might be some in the audience. You appear on a lot of Mexican television and radio. True. And, uh, would you do, do that joke in let Mexico? Me, let me tell you what I did. And when I was, come back. When I was doing the uni, when I was doing the, the, the I, for four years I was on Univision, the Spanish language television. And I did a joke that's mild by American standards, and I got deluged and, and even banned in Chile in different places. I did a, a skit of Margaret Thatcher on the dating game with uh, Pinochet of Chile, with uh, Fidel Castro, right. and, and, and with Noriega of Panama. <laughs> and I dressed, I dressed up like them, and, uh, and Margaret Thatcher, you know, uh, the English, for some strange reason, Anytime a man puts on a woman's dress, now that's funny in England. Why? I don't know. <laughs> but I did that, and, uh, and you know, people laugh. Well, the government of Chile informed me that I was persona non grata, like I was planning to go down there. <laughs> you know? I turned to my mom and goes, damn, you know? And I was so looking forward to seeing the, the firing squad. Uh, <laughs> So, so what happens, what's, what's happened in Latin America is actually very sad. There is a very, very funny comedian um, uh, from Argentina uh, uh, who, who did a, a mild joke about how the Argentine regime were the, uh, were the best magicians in the world because they had been able to make a thousand people disappear a day. <laughs> mild, right? By our standards, well, he was, he disappeared. The luxury that we Americans have here, and those of us who practice this profession, which I consider very noble, uh, is the fact that we are able to jab, we are able to, to talk about our, our, those who govern us, we are able to express ourselves without the fear of having somebody knock on your door and... I, uh, but and I, you my up. Judy, you write political jokes. Right. How, where, do you go, where do you go and how far do you go? Here's a joke I did recently at the election, and I got a lot of flack from it at the Comedy Store. I did a joke because they had just had the Democratic and the Republican National Conventions. And I'm watching the Republican Convention, and it was scaring. It was like a KKK convention. They kept putting the camera on the five black people with their, that were there. And then they interviewed them afterwards as they were vacuuming and cleaning up, and they said, what do you guys think? <laughs> now, I got a lot of flack for that, but there's a politically correct thing. I am, am a Democrat, and, and I, that thing really scared. It well, then, struck then, me. Buddy, you've done political jokes. No. No? You don't no. do political don't jokes? Don't do political jokes. Oh, I, did, I didn't realize that. Never. Never did it. You know why? They don't last. In a couple of years, it's over. If I'm going to create something, I want something that's permanent. The <laughs> permanence of his filth. When, when, you, <laughs> when you can have a dirty joke just last for ages. <laughs> you know, you know I didn't. You know, no. two cows. <laughs> two I, cows in, in a field will be funny long after you and I are gone, sir. Oh, yeah. Af long after Especially if the white cow is disappointed. You know? <laughs> I. <coughs> going I'd home like to. No, no. <laughs> I'd like to come down in the audience, and if any of you have any questions, We'll take as many or as few <laughs> as we can. Sir, would you? Well, I was wondering, uh, uh, Paul, you said earlier that you, you don't mind politically incorrect humor or whatever, as long as the joke is funny. But if a guy, if a, if a white bread wasp comedian gets up and tells a joke about Mexican Americans greasing their hair back, would you really think that was funny? Not the way you say it. No. <laughs> Your name? Uh, Doug. Doug. Hi. Um, I had a question for Judy. Um, <clears throat> a couple months ago, Jerry Lewis was here giving a talk, and someone asked him about what, how he felt about um, women in stand-up comedy, and he made a comment that uh, he felt that uh, Carol Burnett and comics like that never made him laugh because they were too much like men. They, they got too much down in the dirt. They lost their dignity, and he was only... Uh, Ken. Well, I don't think 
Stand-up comedy is the most dignified profession. So I think that that is just ridiculous, and I think he has no sense of humor, and he should go host a telethon and shut up. If a comedian has a professional engagement that they just cannot get out of, and they've suffered a personal tragedy, can you put forth a real comedic effort? I was uh, scheduled to perform probably the biggest comedy show that every year it's at Gainesville, Florida, which is, uh, which is they call Gator Growl, 80,000 people. And my father passed away two days, and I hopped on that plane, and I couldn't do it. I landed, and I went back. I just couldn't do it. I believe that there are moments in time when you have to separate your show business from your personal life. Tim? Yes. What is it about slapstick or you know physical humor that that makes it universally funny? And do you do you think it is? I mean, do you think there will ever be a point when it won't be funny anymore? Well, it, it kind of um, gets over a lot of language barrier. You don't have to do a, a lot of talk with it. You can just do the physical part of it. So that'll you know enlarge an audience. This is my you know my area is physical comedy, and I enjoy. Uh, dealing with people and uh, uh, putting, in a sense, people on. Uh, a lady asked me today for an autograph, and I, and I wrote it out, and I said, you know, excuse me, this is the best one I've ever done. <laughs> Would you mind very much if I kept this? <laughs> and she said, no, go ahead. And I said, thank you so much. Now, I still have that autograph. Now, this lady has got to go home. And she, I had one for a while, but... <laughs> It was, he did it so well, he went, now, to me, that's kind of amusing. I amuse myself all day long with uh, <laughs> crap like that. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, and would you join me in thanking our amazing guests, Judy Gold, Tim Conway, Buddy Haggett, and Paul Anthony.